So, thank you for being here, first of all. My name is Maxim. I'm the co-founder of um, Adyax. We, we are here as sponsors too. And uh, we do only fixed budget projects, a lot of them. Um, and, and the funny thing that almost all the estimates are done by me, so I'm the guy who is always wrong. So that's why I was like presenting this session. Um, the usual size of the projects runs from 3,000 to 15,000 hour, man hours. So it's quite big projects. I don't know which size of you. Um, and so we'll talk about estimates. And probably the estimating is um, quite the most dangerous work because you are playing with money. And if you're losing money on the very big projects, it might be really complicated for some companies. How much of you uh, did project with losing money on projects? Like, I say the truth. <laughs> OK, and that's more. OK, so that's quite normal. I mean, um, everybody makes errors and estimates. And uh, from what I know, that 70% of IT projects are late. And if you are late, you are probably losing money on some way or margin, at least. Um, so this. Everybody knows these scary deadlines approaching and you, you add people to do more and, and the deadlines are never met and after a while nobody cares about deadlines and yes, I will do it as up. And, and of course, in the company, if you do not meet deadlines, you are probably wrong with estimates, you lose money, your, your team is being like more laxist with, with estimates, with, with control of the time frames. And, and that's the funny thing is that we are quite smart here, all, all the guys we are attending DrupalCon, we, do, we know views, panels, you, some of you already installed Drupal 8 and know how to use Symfony now. And, uh, and again, we're still doing very basic errors and estimates, uh, even if we are quite smart guys. Um, and in, but in the everyday life, like your daily life, you do a lot of estimates every time, and you're doing pretty well, I think. Imagine you are in Prague, like right now, and you have a good friend calling you, saying, "What that?" Saying, "Hey, let's having a beer somewhere in the, or a wine uh, in a good bar in Prague." And well, what you'll do? You'll probably open your Google Maps. You'll check out the address. You say, "Okay, I need 28 minutes to go there. I will add five minutes." And it's only four task jobs. You go down. You walk to the metro. You take a tram. You take a metro, and you, you arrive. And even there, you probably know some friends that are always late even these simple tasks. So on the projects, it's like in this project, it's very simple projects. You always have some errors and estimate and unpredictable errors. Some unpredictable events, what you should have think about. Imagine you will go there and there is a strike, so you will be late and you have to go by, f by walking to this bar. So you have to add these things, of these risks to your project plan and to your time frame. Unfortunately, um, some events uh, have so big impact or, or so unpredictable that it's almost impossible to, to prevent. Imagine there's an atomic bomb throwing down to Prague. You, there will be no bar, no friend, and probably no more you. So it's like an infinite journey for you, and, and there's no way to predict this risk, right? So, but, but in Drupal projects and more in IT projects, there are not so many unpredictable events that can occur. Basically, we could split them into three main groups. The first one is who is doing the estimates usually. It would be the project manager, the salesperson, the senior developer, the guys who is in relationship with the client. And actually, this is not the guy who will actually code the thing. And you cannot have a company with 100 person on its only senior positions. So the guy who will actually work on it will do it with junior position, so you will have, for example, somebody will, how much time you need to, to theme a web form, or oh, half a day, and then if you give it to a guy and he will like, look what's the web form, how it works with widgets, I have the problem in Internet Explorer 8, and then he'll spend two days. So this is a usual problem. When you do estimates, there's probably a senior guy doing it, and that's my cue that his junior will then give it. Um, the second problem is the perimeter problem, um, or misunderstanding or changes in the perimeter. So if um, usual problem like we face every day, like I need a workflow, okay, we'll do a workflow. You think about like a couple of rules, a couple of roles, and at the end the client arrives and said, no, 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 when I want to do workflow, I wanted a notification 
five roles, permission, user groups, and, and dashboards, and everything. And then they say, oh, 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 this is not what was expected, and say, it was written in the specs. Do it. Okay, you lose money. And the final uh, is less important, I think, is, is the human factor. Well, that's arrived like maybe two or three times in Ajax. The project manager leaves or breaks a hand, and well, left hand is not that important, but right hand is more. Um, so this is almost all that can occur during a project. But what do we really estimate in a Drupal project? So when you take the code, the RFP, you will probably have to, to split down the project into parts. So before going into details, let's define some variables. We'll use those variables all around the presentation. So the first thing is the complexity of the website. Well, it's, it's statistics, okay, based on the 300 projects we've done so far, but you will probably recognize some patterns there. There is a very simple website, like not so much content types, no workflow, very simple. Um, data flow, well, some templates, classical, small company websites. Then you have the medium sites with more content type, with some external data sources from XML, some workflow, custom business features, maybe some data migration. And finally, we have these complex websites, the big one, um, with transactional e-commerce website, community websites, uh, with a lot of uh, content types, templates, and, and, and data migrations, and external web system, like SAP or whatever. On the other hand, we have this front-end thing because a lot of Drupal websites you are actually doing theming, so we also split them into three. We have like standard, desktop output, blocks, and Internet, 10 support, Internet Explorer 10 support only, with some Chrome, Safari, nothing complicated. Then we have this mobile theme, but not for all the features. And finally, we have this full responsive design, like a fancy thing, like squeezing your website, web browser and everything moves around with like, nice um, advanced jQuery animation. So this, so we'll use this F123 and S123 later. So remember it. <laughs> so the first thing the, the guys in, 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 in doing Drupal will do is like set up models. There are a lot of models in Drupal, 20,000 of them. So you spend a lot of time selecting models, creating content types, um, configuring all of them, user roles, permission rules, views, everything. So it takes a lot of time, but you don't go into deep details at the beginning. So you'll spend probably some couple of days uh, for the small sites and more. Just about the figures, those are statistics related to our projects. Doesn't, doesn't mean that it works for everybody, but I think that the relationship between the three are quite okay. So, well, it's complicated to say estimates. It's an estimate of estimates. Um, the second thing is the development platform setup. Many guys forget about to put it in their code, uh, but you take time to set up Redmine user accounts, mailing lists, uh, MySQL if you are running your websites on Acquia or you have to also set up their things, Git account, GitLab, whatever. So you will have to spend time and often you forgot to put them in the code. Um, the second uh, thing we have to talk is the context. This is a quite complicated thing because it's like a cancer inside your Drupal site because when you talk about context, you take, talk about path, auto, and URL setup. You have advertisement, tagging, URLs, page title, um, context, microdata, everything, and all those small tasks, because it's not complicated to sub eight page title, path out, it's like take an hour, but if you multiply this by the number of content types, and if you add a lot of context to this, this can be really painful and take much more time than you, you think it would take. For example, we, if, um, I will give you an example. Um, we got a website, e-commerce website with only 30 templates, and we asked it to the client, hey guys, uh, please provide me the tagging for, for Google Analytics. So we was adding like, well, no problem, I added three days to do that, it will be okay. And finally we received like 70 pages tagging specification from the client with every single click tracked down and, and, and the cart and the check out with different business logic everywhere. So we spent two weeks doing that. And again, the guy said, hey, hey, it wasn't the specs. Well, actually not the specs, but we'll talk about the change request later. Um, then the 
the most important for me. I think even if, uh, if you are late, you can leave just after this slide because, because the templates are actually, I think there is a direct correlation between the project size and the number of templates. Of course, you have some particular websites with complex business logic or complex external systems. But again, templates for me is, if you know how to count your templates, you almost covered half of the work in Estimate because there is a lot of work on templates. If you take a website, classical website, you will start with sketching with the client. You will work with the client to sketch the, all the website's templates like contact form, sitemap, homepage, article, product page, whatever. Then you will probably do some wireframes to validate it with exact proportions and, and fonts and things. And then you have some back and forth things with the client and then you have to design these templates and probably you will need some static HTML for these templates to validate it works on all responsive and multiply this by, if you have a responsive with three breakpoints, you multiply by three and then you have your developer at the end who is doing the templates actually creating the TPL files in Drupal. So at the end, adding one template, adding a lot of work. Of course, these numbers again depends on the complexity of your templates, of your site, but, well, yeah, if you have 30 templates, if you have a site which has 60 templates, I think the budget will double. It's quite a good number. So, next point is data migration. It's a quite complicated subject because it's very complicated to estimate. If you are running with a Drupal to Drupal data migration, it should be okay, you have a lot of modules, migrate, feeds, whatever. Um, if you are running a project with some structured data, MySQL, MSSQL, it should be okay. And then if you have this website with you know, only title and HTML inside, and the guy said, please, if you have the bold, put it in a, as a teaser. If you have a ULLI, put it in this uh, multi-entities, um, multi well, it, you will have a lot of pain. So. Usually when you got the RFP, you don't have any big, so much information about the data sources, so you cannot really estimate exactly then. But um, what we've noticed is that it's relatively dependent on the number of content types. So usually to migrate one content type, for example, article, from Drupal to Drupal, it will take you one day just to figure out. Um, from structured debit, two, three days per content type. And if you are going from HTML, don't, well, I cannot estimate, you just say to the client, we'll see, or, or add some numbers from, like, okay, we'll see, but yeah, it's quite complicated because you will face a lot of problems with HTML migration. Um, another thing, guys, who do estimates always forget that it's really complicated, it's the number of deploys. Because actually when the deploy is a crazy thing because it's quite normal, it's quite easy. Well, we do agile, we'll deploy at each sprint, it's okay. Um, and actually it might be a real painful thing because depending on the number of deploys you'll have on the project and the, and the hosting company you're, you're using, the deploy may be a real nightmare. Um, I give you an example, we have a website where the hosting company wasn't aware of Drupal. Actually, wasn't aware of hosting, I think. But, um, <laughs> but the guys was, deploy was manually using FTP and uploading the entire website, no differential deploy. So imagine the, the guys, uh, developers, have to create features, uh, pack all them together, create a, a tar file and send them, and then they deploy manually, and they forgot all the time they deploy because they have free front-end web service, and they forgot one, and random errors and everybody calls us saying, hey guys, you did crap and we did not crap. Okay, prove, okay. So depending of your, of your partner with hosting company and the number of deploys, it can be really costly. So usually you, have, you will spend like half a day with Drupal clouds because there are a lot of them now. Um, and uh, um, for Capistrano, so it's a classical uh, hosting company, but you automated the deploy process. You'll, half like a day and old school three days, but again, these numbers. Um, remember that during a deploy, you not only have to deploy actually the thing, but the developers has to create features uh, for features doesn't work all the time. You will have to export views. You will have to create model update thing. You will have to 
put it all together, deploy, test the deploy, test the rollback if you want, and then deploy actually to production or pre-production. So it takes time. And if you have a, a deploy each sprint, you'll have to think about this time. Um, the test and the QA. Well, how much of you have a dedicated test teams? Well, yeah, of course. Um, I, I, I wonder why developers do bugs. I actually have some of my developers here looking at me, but well, everybody do bugs, so that's why we need testing. Testing might be a dedicated team or, or actually your um, um, developers doing only tests. It's, it's, it doesn't matter. But what we noticed is that testing is directly related to the number of hours of development. This is kind of empiric number. It works all the time. So this is quite, I'm quite sure of this estimate. Um, I include in these tests, of course, not only manual testing, but also HTML cross-browser testing and reaching automated tests with Selenium or simple tests, whatever. So, if, of course, it depends on the complexity of the website. Because, for example, um, if you do an e-commerce website, the developers will spend like two or three or five days doing the checkout process. But there is a lot of, a lot of features inside the checkout process. You will have to test it in different scenarios, cancel, roll back, go back, and try again. So depending on the complexity of the website and the business logic, some business cases might be very easy to code and very long to test. Import, export, things like that take time because you have many use cases. Um, <clears throat> well, then, then you have the management. This is, again, this is very different from one client to another. Um, basically, it depends on your organization, how you manage the project, how smart your developers are, how smart your project managers are, how is your relationship. What we've noticed, actually, is that it's not really related to, to the project itself. It's more related to the client. Um, um, I've got a client with a, with a social network closed. Social network with kind of medium-sized project, and everything was quite okay, and, and uh, it was a nightmare, because five person knowing nothing about web, calling all everybody every day, and asking things like, I cannot connect at my site at adjax.com. I said, just, you type it what? Adjax at, at adjax.com, but no, no, at, and Arobots think, and they say, yes, yeah, not normal, it's not writing an email, and all the time during one year, it was like this. So for that kind of clients, you will need like much more project management. But usually these figures work quite well. Again, it depends on the size of the project because usually when the project goes bigger, you have more, you have to face more people in front of you. At the client side, you have the functional guy, the marketing guy, the design, um, probably the top management thing. So you have like steering committees thing. So you will have to spend much more time. Um, the last thing you have to, to quote also is specifications. Um, actually, who writes specification for each project? Wow, that's not enough, guys. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a big error if you don't write specs because, well, with all this agile thing, well, we don't do specs, we do sprints, okay, but <clears throat> actually specification is the only way to not lose money on a fixed price project. Because even if you do agile, we do agile sometimes in, on, with our clients, but we write specifications sprint by sprint. So we have a quite Bible of the project. So when you write specification in the most detailed way possible, the client will never say, hey, it was, it was in my original RFP, whatever. You say, guys, you validated the specs. Once you validated the specs, everything else out of the specs will be an evolution or change request. And this is quite easy to, to discuss because you wrote the spec, he validated it. It's easier to discuss rather than going back again and again to the initial RFP and saying, what was this workflow thing? Um, so, well, yes, again, this, these numbers are quite, um, well, it depends basically of the size of your project, but really uh, reaching specs is, is, is quite really important, it's, it's the only way have, you, wait, you can manage this change request later. Um, ah, wait, 
we forgot the most important, the features. I mean, the, all this business logic like makes your website unique and, and, and different from the all others. Of course, we've talked about theming, uh, uh, Drupal setup things, but the features are, are quite unique. Well, there is no magic rules to estimate features. It's like everything. You have to split it into small parts. The more precise you will be in your code, the better will be uh, your estimates. For example, voting, don't put like three days for voting. Uh, try to think about like voting, I have to install five star, voting API, set up all the content types that are um, touched by the voting. I have to theme the five star. Then I have to create a block with uh, most uh, voted content. I have to theme it and I have to integrate this in my website and I have to deploy it. So the only feature that seems very easy, five star and voting, Actually, it's not that easy if you split it in small parts and you think about how much really I need time to, to do each small part. That's this estimates. Then when you do estimates, basically you do it against the RFP or tender or specs. And then you will see like, you'll probably see like everything going from one page, one email RFP, uh, going to 300 pages RFP. Well, we got all of them and it, doesn't really matter how much money the client have. It's, well, that's the culture. So again, we split this RFP into three big parts. The first one, we have the user-centric RFP. So this is the new kind of uh, agile thing we see in the RFP right now. Guys saying, as an admin, I can create a content type. As an admin, I can, as an anonymous user, I can go to an article page. And this for 300 pages. Um, well. I don't like this kind of RFP, but there are some advantages because you have a detailed presentation for the feature. Because it describes on different personas, you can really understand how the feature they want to implement work. Because, for example, for our workflow problem, they will describe as in, for each role, you, they should describe how this workflow works. But you, to, to create, to estimate the feature, to understand it's the definition of the feature is spread across several user stories, so we have to summarize it in one piece, which might be quite long. And then you will be have to be very careful with the template counting because usually guys doesn't present some wireframes. So as a user, I can see articles. Okay, you know you have article templates. You probably had some homepage, but that's kind of complicated to, to count the number of templates. The second type of RFP you have is the page-centric RFP. So you have a bun bunch of wireframes or designs, sometimes annotated, sometimes not. They're like, this is my website, please do it. Um, this is good, I think I prefer this because actually you, it's easy to count templates and you, have, you reduce your risks uh, of misunderstanding. Um, but you will need to be very careful with um, all the business rules and, and, and the back office and um, and because we got the client, for example, for um, um, real estate websites, and they, there are blocks like with promoted apartments, and actually we put like, okay, five days to do that. And what the client actually wanted uh, was much more complicated because uh, they wanted like very complex business logic depending on search result, which search result is a Joe, uh, search result using Apache Solar with if you are promoted and if your apartment near than 50 kilometers, then push this block there. Well, and all this all around. So you have to be careful with these templates only RFPs. And finally, we have this feature list. Uh, this is usually old school, okay? I want voting, I want comments, I want articles, I want homepage, do it. Um, well, it's easy to get featured, okay? But uh, uh, you have to imagine all the context templates, ACO, and all the stuff behind the features and the, the difference between different bidders might be really important. Um, that the thing. Finally, you have these hidden costs because when you are reading the RFP, many things are not described. And again, if you are wanted to provide a good quality job, you have to bill and, and prepare that. So, for example, um, you have the back office cleanup. Okay, Drupal 8 looks good. I saw the keynote but uh, Drupal 7 uh, right now, and you have to clean up things because you will not present to, to the site administrators and contributors all the crappy things with path ring or whatever. Um, so you will probably need to spend some time of cleaning up. 
um, workflow, notification, user permission, the client usually don't think about that, but they want it actually, so you have to probably add them as an option. The y, uh, YZBX zip top is a classical thing. I will add CK editor, that will be fine. And then you will see like crappy red things climbing inside the, your site because the guy's adding copy paste from Word or whatever. So you'll have also to prepare, like make the YZBX render exactly like the front end does, does and things. And of course you have optimization. Um, Drupal is a slow CMS by default. So you'll have to add caching, memcache, varnish, yeah, edge side includes, probably some uh, CDN and all this together makes time. Lazy load images, it's small things but you will spend time on it. And the client will not think about it before. Um, one thing we've noticed, we lost a lot of projects because we were adding all these things inside our res response. So we was like, guys, we're a small company. How may we, how the hell we make, we are more expensive than like Capgemini. It's, it's just why. Uh, and after that, we understood that there is some tricks when you're answering, especially public RFP, to avoid being the most expensive. Um, the first thing is being the most precise possible in your codes. Uh, at the beginning, we was like putting 20 or 10 lines in our codes, and then we ended up with hundreds of lines in our codes. Why? Because the first thing is it would be easier if you win the project to say, hey guys, look, there was one line for that, there is no line for what you're asking me for, sorry. And then it's much more complicated to discuss for example, if you say, okay, theming, 25 days, and the client say, no, 22. Uh, okay, and by I sign today, and I say, okay, 22. A 20? Okay, 20. And if you have one template saying, three hours here, homepage, five hours, article, three hours, product page, four hours, this point, four hours. Well, you will say, four hours for product page? Yes, four hours. Hmm. Three, no, four, okay. So it's much easier, it's much more complicated to negotiate with you if, you if you're very detailed and precise. And the other thing is that it shows you are like, understand your, his project, and not just like putting 20 days. So um, then, once you set up all this bunch of lines in your quote, take care, because you probably will be the most expensive, because other guys doesn't think about everything, and will not put everything, so put options. Put everything as options. Back office options. Everything that is not asked directly in there, if we put as options. And then you will have the chance to explain to the client one, why you put this option and why he needs that. So we'll enable the discussion and then you enable the contact with the client. So then you can maybe win the project because you're talking to each other. And you show to the client that you understand his needs and you think more than just what he asked for. Um, of course, in, yeah, there will be a lot of unclear uh, feature and you will not have the possibility to discuss with the client before the release of your uh, answer. So take the low estimates and explain exactly what you will do. Don't, from, he asked for workflow, don't put workflow three days. Say, workflow using rules module with three roles and no notification with one dashboard, three days. So when he asked for five dashboards and five roles, he says, sorry guys, we wrote three days. So it's more precise, less problems. Or you can do like this, some big ones. We, we, we know that they do that. You underestimate the build and hope to get money from the run. This is a very dangerous thing. We don't do that at Alex, but I know some companies will do that because to win the client, they sign the build, they lose money on the build, and they know that they'll have support and MCO and things like that. <sighs> So the build phase, well, now we, now what to estimate, we know how we know, well, we try to know how to answer the RFP. Now we, we want the project that's funny and that the problem starts because then you can really lose money because if you don't win, you probably don't lose it. So the first thing is to measure the time because, well, we're doing Drupal shops, we're running Drupal shops, we pay salaries, salaries is money based on time, so the more time you spend, the more money you lose, so you have to measure it. If you don't measure it, you will not be able to control anything. So, first thing is, is set up 
time tracking software. Redmine does it for us, but you can use whatever you want and, and, sit and ask everybody time logs. It's like just mandatory, everybody. Who is using time logs actually here? Wow, yeah, good. Well, you need to, to time log everywhere, project managers, everybody. And usually what you should do is one line in your initial quotation should, should be related to one task in Redmine, and then all the issues like bugs and evolution should be attached to this super task. So everybody logs time, and at the end you can say the difference between your initial quotation and actually what the guys did. did. So not only you will see uh, if you are losing money in the project, but you will see where, and then you can check out with guys who was responsible for this task, why we spend much more time that we shouldn't. What we also create is a project backlog with, on the left, my initial code, and then the real task on the right. So we can say configure certain types. It seems to be like we lose time on that, but actually this is a very good way of control because as the developers will fill these things, actually they can warn you saying, guys, we are going out of estimates because the project manager cannot think about everything on the project. He's like doing client, developers, testers, uh, problems, and, and he will not be having an eye on everything. These kind of things will help you. And then we have per sprint backlog with estimates and the real hours that was done. So to sum up with this, everybody must log time. That's mandatory. Uh, you should keep the link between initial code and the next. And uh, one thing we noticed is that before, the estimates wasn't shared with developers. We was doing like, we do estimates, we give tasks, and then we like, they see us red, like, oh guys, you should speed up. They understand that we are out, but they, 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 we didn't share that. Now we share the estimates with everybody in the project. Every single guy working in the project knows about the estimates of the whole project. It helps like to have the spirit of control. Um, and you have to stick to the plan. If you set up time logs and specification, do it even when you have panic. That's, if you have panic, stick to the plan. Don't, uh, don't cancel time log. Don't stop the specification. It's, it's better to have been late and explain to the client you are been late than to completely destroy your process inside your company. Um, then the credit, this is the way we found out how to manage um, evolution change request. So imagine the fact that you have answered in a very detailed way your quotation, you created your uh, specification for each sprint, everything is covered, and then the clients ask something more. So the, the good thing is to set up some kind of shared Excel file um, with the client where you put the feature he asked, the estimates, and, and, and the total at the end. Um, this to avoid, the idea is to avoid sending uh, bills like, uh, please sign me this, please sign me this. This can be like harassment during the project. 300 here, 200 is small amounts, small numbers, but here is receiving this. Please sign, please sign, please sign, it's not okay. So set up a policy with, with your client saying, we are okay by mail, and then you have this control, shared doc, and he, he's, he sees the total number of amounts, and at the end of the project, you just build the total. Uh, so it, he's not frustrated, he's not, well, I think it's better. And what we also introduced uh, since this year is a stop day. In the middle of each project, we stop everything, like for a half a day or for a day, and looking, okay, let's like, check what we have to do, and what we still have, how much, burn, we, how much money we burned so far. It's very important that everybody stops and speak by Skype, in a room, whatever, about this, like, let's go. We're in the middle, what, what we have still to do and how much time we spend. Because it, when you're doing the project, you're all in sprint release, sprint release, doing code bugs, and you are not like, you don't take step apart to, to check out the, the problems. Um, finally, what really uh, makes your project going wild is this never-ending acceptance period. Like, yeah, yeah, we finished like 85% or 95% of the feature, it's okay. And then the project, I uh, have acceptance content, acceptance problem bugs, and still, and that lasts for months. Um, this is what makes you lose money. Um, you should define at the very beginning of the project, the acceptance period time. And, and you should be very, very careful with the client, very 
strong with the client saying, guys, you have to ask, you have to test the website, you have to report bugs, be careful, you have only two weeks, three weeks, one month, three months, whatever, but you have a fixed uh, timeline. It doesn't mean that the, you will have to solve all the bugs during this period, but it shows to the client and to your team that you have a fixed time for the acceptance, and then the site will probably go live, and then you have this guarantee period. So, you, you must define this time, yes. And, and also, you have to define with the client what blocks uh, the release. That's something really important. When you start your, your, your acceptance period, you have to talk with the client saying, okay, guy, please, and when you open a bug, you put blocker, only bugs, bugs that actually blocks live. So in this way, when you define this rule with the client, he's okay to go live with some bugs, which, which he could be reluctant with an acceptance period when you didn't define this blocker issue definition with them. So once you set up that, he understands that blocker means we stop everything and we solve this issue and it's blocking for the live. So it helps to time box the acceptance. Also, you have to, the client are very scared about what happens after the day we released. So you have to explain to him this guarantee period, I don't know your contracts, how they put three months, six months, two months, whatever. But you have to explain to him, don't worry, we'll be still here to make him go live. Because your guarantee period, you're probably three months or whatever, is by contract. So you know that you have to go live as soon as possible. It's better for you. So you have to calm down the client, explain in detail what happens during the warranty period. Well, the last thing um, is the support and maintenance. Some private joke for French guys. Um, support and maintenance is, we notice that you lose, the project stops, like it's going live, you, you was, you, you, you was paid for the, for the project, it was okay, but you don't stop to losing money because the client will still call you. Um, I don't know how to create an article. Oh, please, uh, I think uh, everything is broken on, uh, on homepage. And usually it's problems of contribution, maybe some bugs, but usually it's some kind of support tasks. And it's very complicated for, especially for a small company working with big clients since one year on a project, like saying, oh, so you cannot call me, you don't have a support contract, sorry, bye. Oh, well, it's, it's not possible. So to avoid this kind of discussion at the end of the project, again, talk about support in the middle or the beginning of the project saying, guys, we have a support policy, buy ticket, fixed price, whatever, but we have this support thing. Um, this is for you to help you. Do you want to take it? Take, talk again during the project and intensify these talks before the release date. Because if you, if you start talking about support at the end of the project, he said, like, it will be like, a little bit complicated to, to talk with the client about support. Of course, you can also uh, go with some Acquire or Commerce Guy support, whatever, but if you probably do support on your own projects, you will need that ticketing system or whatever. So, well, that's it. So, well, if you have some questions, you're welcome. I'll try to answer them. You have actually, you have the, the microphone, it would be easier if everybody can hear you, but okay, yeah. Thank you, I have two questions. First, on the functional specification, into what detail do you go? You talked about being able to point to the functional spec and saying, uh, hey, this wasn't in there, so that's going to cost extra, that's gonna be a change order. And the problem that we run into at, at my company is that often the functional specification is too detailed for the client to understand. So they end up signing off on it, but really not fully understanding what they're signing. You know, there was three content types. Well, what's a content type? You know, they, don't, they might not know. Yeah, and that's, that's true. Actually, actually, this is a technical specs. We split it like functional. It's really like blocks and wireframes. And yeah, <coughs> the, the level of detail of the specification is, is quite complicated. That's why on big projects, 
we try to split down the specification to sprints and propose to the client specification before the sprint so they don't have like 500 pages. But our usual specs are like six or 500 pages for a big project. Um, you have to explain, we, we, sp we spend half a day for each sprint to explain the specs and read them with the client. So if he has questions, he asks us. So we make sure that he actually understands. But again, we ask to sign because otherwise, well, you cannot. And if you don't put enough details, then you will always have some extra discussions which are not very good and during the project too. So well, explain the specs and split them in small parts. I think content types, it's a quite easy to understand for some clients. Well, if you explain, show him. And yeah. Yeah, I had uh, w one other question. Um, so when, um, when you talked about you guys use Redmine for your ticketing system, we use Open Atrium, and we actually um, uh, create accounts for our clients, and they're actually in there in the issue queues, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. resolving the tickets and, and responding, and you know, we ask for their feedback. Um, but that's sometimes problematic, not having a sort of separate internal issue queue and sort of an external. So I was wondering why? how you guys handle that. Uh, why it's a problematic? Uh, because then, um, you know, we, we like to be open and transparent with our clients, but sometimes, you know, there are certain things you might not want the client to see or, um, you know, just sort of being able to, um, you know, have issue queues that are sort of more technical and maybe mm -hmm. separate from the client, but then also you have to communicate with the client as well, so it's a, it's a tough balance. Well, we use only one system that's what's often asked, but when we, we work for some agencies like subcontractors, they ask us from separate red mines. But uh, when we do indirect, with like 85% 80, of our clients are direct, we always, they all, everybody in the project, everybody in red mine, and usually guys who are not technical enough or he has not, they are not interested, they never log in, you see them like never log in, okay? Uh, well, being transparent, and even if you have problems, it's a good thing because what scares out the client when you say we are be late, for example, he he can understand you're being late, but he wants to understand why and how to avoid this. So if he see all these people working nights and days and logging and commits, if he, even if he doesn't understand, he see the activity of the project, so he knows that you work hard on resolving problems. So we offer uh, all access to the red mine. Everybody sees everything there. It's quite easier to explain things like, look, it's inside, there, there, there. If you don't care, you don't, you don't look inside, but it's easier, I think, from my point of view, I know. Thank you. Hi, um, Taco from Gold Gorilla, the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think you did a really good effort uh, using uh, statistical data mm -hmm. to solve this problem. And um, as you said, 70% of the ICT projects in all our countries, we can name one of you, usually from the government, they're very good at this, that fail. and. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons why there's so many people here because it's not uh, you know all the tech guys and uh, uh, we can manage this, but but real good project management and a good method of of uh, solving these issues is very important for any project to succeed. Um, so you've done this exercise by making these estimations. Do you have data on using this method for estimations and real project data um, and the delta data? The, the, yes, about the, data. The, the, yeah, so, so, I mean the so delta between what we estimated the real numbers. Yeah, and and my fundamental question is, especially for S3 projects, mm -hmm. we do a lot of this. Can you really estimate in front? Because I saw a lot of 15 plus, you know. Yeah. Um, I know migrations that take like weeks. So can you really make an estimation beforehand of how much work it takes to do a project? Well. Um, Usually what happens, you can do real estimates, like uh, how wrong they will be, that the question actually is. Uh, uh, every estimates are good estimates at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so well, that immigration is a good question. It, like, it's a good should, example. My, my question is, should we do this? Like, aren't we going down the rabbit hole and shouldn't we just move this to the past and go to a much more agile way of contracting, which, which yeah. we did two years ago, my life has become much better. Uh, yeah. My developer's life has become much better. Like and you. our clients are much more satisfied. Yeah. Um, and I see you're taking like sprints and backlogs and you're slowly moving into this agile way. But, but if, I, if you would take the step and lose the specifications, go to agile design, 
we can really uh, do much better projects that are on time, that are in budget, uh, and have a, a really good quality. Just we have this flexible scope. Yeah, I, I totally agree that, that that's in theory, in practical, it's, it's, it's the truth. The only thing is that how to explain. I know that in Northern Europe it's quite easier to, to make this agile thing. In South Europe or in US or, or in France, for example, if you have a tender with like half a million tender, uh, everybody will have to answer the fixed, fixed budget. They don't want to hear about like, we'll see, like agile will adjust the budget. No, it's, it's, just it's not about, th this is the thing. If you, if you say this, you, you do not understand agile because agile works with a fixed budget. So you can promise your clients a fixed budget, fixed time frame, just not, not the fixed scope. So every time somebody's talking about fixed price, they don't understand all agile projects are fixed price. And this is the thing we should sell our clients. You get a fixed price, you get a fixed deadline, and you get really good quality. We just cannot make the promise yeah, what you will get. Yeah, but the perimeter then is not fixed. Yeah, this is a tough sale. I'm not, I'm not saying this is easy because the trust is very important here. And you need yeah. a, a good track record. But if you can make this case, and if we all should do this, like don't promise these things you cannot promise. There's no way you can promise an integration with a third-party tool beforehand. This is, this is like, even if you document it like 200 pages, you'll still end up with things you cannot expect beforehand. I mean, why not stop this altogether? Lawyers aren't, you know, saying like, okay, I'm going to do this for 10,000 euros beforehand. No, they say, well, we're just going to do the project and, and we'll see. Yeah, you know? the problem is that you have a lot of like, you don't see the client before the RFP answers, so you will write down, yes, we'll do that, but you then you'll ask like, confirm that this is included in the perimeter, and you don't have even a call with the client before, so you're not bid for that kind of projects. Well, there are a lot of them like, sending a big RFP, 500 pages, you don't have the permission to communicate with the client before, you have to ask questions by mail that is sent to all the, you know, all this big, if, if we, and then they, they ask to confirm the perimeter, the exact, that yes, I will do that, yes, I will do that, yes, yeah, I will do that. Th these, these are not the clients we will take, and, yeah. you know, because they're too risky, and, and you know, so I'm just saying there's, there is an alternative, and I really like your effort on, on doing data analysis and, and trying to make conclusions, and we should, and we should do all the time logging, but I think there's a much more better yes, I way know. Of, of doing I know. this. I hope all and the clients can. will move to that. Well, we should all do it. I mean, yeah. let's start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you, men you mentioned about stop days. Yeah. Uh, do you share the fact that you have stop days with your clients and do you ever use that as an opportunity to um, assess, um, reassess the quote and maybe go back with it? Yeah, that, that the scope analysis or workshops or discovery workshops, I, 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 if you can place that with the client, is quite very good. And fortunately, on, on many RFP, you have like one week to answer and even you don't have the time to set up this workshop. We, will, we'll set, we set up this workshop for very big projects. But uh, even with these discovery workshops, uh, the scope analysis is, is, is still estimates because you still can discover many problems within, within the project. But yeah, that's definitely the, we, we do all, we try to do all the time this scope analysis with, with yeah. some workshops. You, you, you may have misunderstood the question. I was talking about the stop, the stop day that you mentioned. Sorry? The stop day. Uh, scope guide? The stop. Stop, the stop day. Ah, stop day. Yes, yeah. Say, so with, sorry. With, that's with, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. With, like. with the stop day. Do you let clients know that that's in, and do you ever use that as an no, opportunity it's, it's to more budget? No, no, the stop day is more internally with the team, saying, okay, guys, are we running out of limits or not? It's just in, internal to check out everything, review the specs, review what we've done, and review what remains to be done. So it's like a re-estimate in the middle of the project for us, just to, to, how, to, to know how to adapt our, our behavior, add more days on offered feature or... or uh, stop down and slow down with offered features, be more careful with evolution and change requests. It's just in the middle of projects, stop and look in, inside your numbers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say thank you that you are sharing this knowledge uh, to us. I think that uh, this is the key for uh, giving uh, better estimates, just to share our knowledge, how, how you do it, how, yeah. how you do it. Uh, thank you. And then uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one, I will try to be fast, the, the first one, uh, in your company, where is it then between the uh, bug fixing phase, the acceptance phase, and uh, starting the support well, phase? Well, yeah. when, the, when the site goes live, actually, that's it's, yeah. well, it's kind of good date. If everybody see that, well, even yeah. if on some project live is not live, but before live we are in bug fixing acceptance period, and then once we've, once we've gone live, 
we start the support and guarantee period. Yeah, but you mentioned something like uh, uh, one the site only with fixing of the critical bugs or, or, uh, or uh, yeah. issues and, and uh, fixing of the rest uh, issues uh, when the site is live. Yes. And, and uh, all these uh, bugs goes uh, in the support phase? Yeah, and actually this is the, the only thing, this is because the acceptance, if you are late, the acceptance may go very far away. But you, if you make accept your clients going live, then by contract your guarantee period is fixed in the time. So, well, it's quite easy then to discuss saying, guys, we are three months after the release, there are still a couple of bugs, but now we have to sign a MCO or support contract for okay. going, so it's, it's just juridic things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, one, one more question. Uh, how do you estimate the third party integrations? I know that this is something like, a, there's no mantra, about this, but uh, how you do it? Well, well, it uh, usually depends on these third-party integrations very large. Yeah, yeah. Or you have data sources of content, then usually you have to check out by content type. Like mm -hmm. if you import events from an external system, check out the system. If it is documented, if it is a standard protocol, it's quite easy. You, mul you check out how much time you will need with feeds to integrate this content type. If this is SAP, for example, for an e-commerce website, well, you have to check out how much uh, interaction web services you have to call. Well, going to split into details, well, it, this is kind of features. Well, you have to split into details and check out this because it's so different with okay. external okay. data systems. And my, and my last question, uh, how, sorry guys, uh, really the last one, uh, 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 how you share this knowledge in your company? Because I see that you're a yeah, smart guy, but, but uh, how you share this knowledge in Oh, well, we, 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 we have these estimates uploaded in Redmine in the wiki with all, uh, with Google Docs, with all estimates are shared with all um, guys in, working on the projects. I mean knowledge of uh, estimating. Ah, uh, well, uh, we, we, we talk a lot with the project. Actually, estimates, initial estimates are done by me, but then project managers do all the change requests and estimates. So, well, we, we, we talk a lot. We don't have any process of sharing. Uh, yeah. well, so we talk like this, okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent and some really good jokes. Um, I wasn't sure if it was about the art of estimating or the art of replying to RFPs. Um, because one of the points that you made at the beginning was that senior people tend to do the estimations and junior people do the work. Um, it's a bit of a principle in Agile that the, the, the people doing the work are the people that should be doing the estimating. Yes, so that's true, but that's, that's exactly. But if you receive again and like, when, how do you win projects? Sometimes guys call in and then you discuss and then you set up the project and then, but actually what happens in, 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 in France, for example, I don't know in, in the US, but in France it's you receive an 300 pages RFP and you have two weeks to answer saying how good you are, how good your guys are, how much it costs and you confirm that everything is inside. And then if I send this in French to my developers who not all speak French, um, they will spend like hours to do that. So the problem is that if I ask to the themer to estimate the templates and to the developer estimate features, then, then we'll probably have to spend like five weeks to estimate because, so we need to go fast and that's why usually guys senior in senior position do the estimates because they know how to understand what the client actually wants behind the lines. The developers probably will not see all these tricks inside the RFP that, that are not de detailedly ex explained. So this is why I don't think that actually developers, actually developers are very good in estimates when they know exactly what to do, but at the stage of the RFP, nobody knows exactly what to do. So you have to project your RFP into a website with everything split out. So this kind of complicated job and it takes time um, for, for developers who are actually developing other projects. Uh, well, that's why we do it this way. Seems to me you might be able to have the best, best of both worlds. You, you're using Redmine. Mm. You're creating high-level epics for everything that you've put in the quote. And then developers are having to break that down into tasks. Yeah. And are they doing the estimating as they break that down and as you yeah. go down into more detail? Yeah. And once they did these estimates, well, so we are in the build phase, they did these estimates, we are able to check out, oh, Fuck, we 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 like five days for uh, in our initial code, and the developers put like 25 days. What happens? So we can dig into the project manager 
spot this out, can dig it, well, guys, maybe we misunderstanding on scope, we can talk with the client to raise a little bit estimates or, or slow down developers saying we don't need all that things inside. So this is a good way to check out where the problems are. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Gretchen from Drupal Squad. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes when delivering estimates to clients, I get a common response of um, they get out their red pen and they say, oh, I will do project management, or no, we will do QA, or I will do content management strategy. Um, do you, A, walk away from those bids, or do you, B, have a, a formula that you apply to your estimates that absorb the inefficiencies when that happens on a project? Uh, not sure I get the question exactly. Because, um, so uh, a, a client decides to do one of the roles themselves yeah. on the project. Oh yeah, they, they want How to have hands on the code. You mean? If not, you want. not the code, but project management or business so analysis. No, no. No, Sorry. this is <laughs> somebody this can is explain me the question. Where the client decides to play the role of project management of, of a project manager or a BA, um, do you um, accept those bids? Uh, well, or we, do you build in additional time for inefficiency? We uh, always add additional project manager because I can't remember any of my client or maybe a couple of them like they are able to manage actually external developers located uh, far away. And again, the problem is that you've set up processes inside your company, you have like your themers, other guys don't have themers. We have only, we do for example, we do this fixed uh, static HTML before doing templating, other guys do it in a different way. So when you have a new project manager like external, they will apply his methods and then, so well, that's, we always add a project manager. So do you have a, a basic percentage that you work with, or is it case by case? Well, it's case by case, of course, because, well, again, if the client is a tech guy with a good team and it's a small project, we add lower figures. If the guy is like marketing department with, uh, with crazy ideas and no idea of techs, and there is a very big project, we add like 25% of project management. Well, it depends on the size of the project because if with a small project you have only one guy in front of you, with a big project you have 10 of them and, and everybody's talking and oh, arguing so well, you have more person. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was a lot of interesting uh, facts and statistics. However, I have a couple of concerns, and the most important is that um, if we are talking about S2 and S3 uh, projects sized by you, uh, I wonder if you have a chance to see how the project size correlate and numbers you provided correlate to uh, team size. Because developing the projects with the two or three uh, engineers in the end, and with the team of 10 and, uh, or 15, if we are talking about big projects, it's a big challenge, and usually there is a, a lot of overheads which should be estimated pretty well. Yeah, but well, that's, that's the same. If, if the project is big, probably the team is big, and then, the, then you have this overhead. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and I would say that the even most important is also the client type. It's, it's sub subjective, so subjective, like you cannot decide like, you are a good client, you are a bad client. But you know, all of you like know this, this, this complicated client that cannot understand anything and don't want just, cannot understand the agile, they don't want to understand the specification, they are you know, changing every time, and then more technical organized things. So I think, yes, of course, the, 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 the estimates based on the size of the projects uh, depending on the size of your team, a bigger project is, probably bigger the team is. So yes, of course there's overhead, so I, I, I try to put these numbers based on the size of the website, but you can just replace size of the website by size of the team. Well. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more small point about specification. You said that uh, you're trying to um, write specification on every project. However, who is paying for this work? Uh, but the client. Is paying because we put what, line with specification. Okay, what will you do if clients you you show to your 
uh, estimation where there is a lot of numbers, uh, well descriptive uh, stories, then clients say, hey, I don't need estimation. I, I don't need specification, I don't want to pay it. Well, we explain that yeah, we it's actually case, need... But, uh, I, ju I just yes. interested in your experience. Yes, I, well, we don't need specification. Actually, you, well, you need them. No, no, you no, need no. Them. you say, I don't want to pay it. Ah, well, this is important for you, not for me. Well, this is well. It's important for me, but it's also documentation. If you can explain, like, hey, guy, if you don't want to, if he wants to stop work with us after one, two, three years, you will have a complete bible of your project, and then you have like twenty percent off, and it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are running of time. Thank you very much. Ah, come on, uh, yeah. Yeah. Up, up, up. Uh, I guess uh, it's more like uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for your presentation and opinion. Uh, but uh, I would also like to join to Netherland uh, guy. I yeah, but I know Wonder, you, yeah. you're Wondercraft, right? So, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm it's Wondercraft. It's easier your side, like, yeah. <laughs> and, you guys are uh, smart there. We're stupid in France, like, you know. No, 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 no. Uh, I, would, I would like to say uh, this uh, process uh, which you described is really good for uh, minimizing risk for mm. vendors. Yeah. Uh, but actually, like, uh, uh, idea or uh, invitation from from Netherlands guy, which wasn't from Wundercard, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And the uh, idea is that we actually would need to figure out how to fix problem of a client that uh, uh, we can define a project on detail level for whatever 500,000 hour project. Yeah. It's like impossible. So. This is the way how we can um, minimize our risk as a vendor, but yeah, it doesn't actually help or fix the problem of the or, client, of, yes, of client exactly. and yes. like project. That I agree, I agree. Scale. But there is a session from uh, ex guy from Node One, I think, about this kind of business okay. oriented things. But well, we're talking about estimates. But right? yeah, but it, yes, it was I really. I agree, yeah. Yep. That's true. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Thanks.